<clears throat> in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, we're all aware of the uh, events that are taking place in Afghanistan and we have witnessed horrific scenes on our screens and through the media, news in any way you want it. The one that came as the top of all of them was the fact that 13 service men and women of our country were killed just a few days ago. Many of them were infants at the time of the terrorist attack of 9-11, 20 years ago. And uh, this made us, many of us, angry and um, uh, asking ourselves why these atrocious attacks against our nation and against humanity take place in the world today when we see we are so advanced and so good at everything we do. And I cannot imagine how the families must feel and those um, mates, th those who served were the ones that lost their lives. What kind of a trauma this is. What an atrocious coward act this was. Cowardly act. <clears throat> Today, brothers and sisters, we remember a number of other atrocities. I invite you to take your bulletin and look at the first page of the epistle reading. The greatest atrocity, atrocity of all is the one that the epistle, listen, the epistle reading brings to us today. Did you notice that? Let us go four lines down the, 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 the text there. It says, brethren, brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you that fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. And there we have it, the atro atrocity. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, not understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him, Christ that is, though they could charge him with nothing deserving death, Yet they asked Pilate to have him killed. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And this is the good news that we proclaim today. Despite the most horrific act that humanity ever has done to kill God, there's the good news. The good news of the resurrection and of death being destroyed and sin, illness, cancer, COVID being trampled over. The second atrocity that we commemorate today is the one of our patron saint, John the Baptist. And this is the feast that the church has placed at the end of the yearly uh, the calendar of the ecclesiastic calendar that ends in just two days. It is a feast that is in our community, unfortunately, has been by tradition, small t, neglected by the will of men. The will of men that took us in the plaza to celebrate the festival and completely forget about John the baptizer. St. John is a special man. And I'd like you to think about this. Who is a big guy in your life? Is it your father? Maybe your mother? Michael Jackson? President Trump? Osama bin Laden? Name some big and think big figures. <clears throat> and these, just like the 13 men and women that lost their lives, just perish in the history, remembered by their names, maybe for a while. Today, brothers and sisters, we are gathered to extol a man. This is the object of our worship that we started last night at Vespers and this morning at Orthros. This is how the Orthodox participate in the life of Christ, of the church. This man we bring to our attention as the greatest of all born from women. Ever. Realize this. From all the people that will be ever born on earth. None will be greater than John the Baptist. None. 
St. John the Baptist was born from barren parents. Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah, the priest in the temple. Remember, the archangel Gabriel, the all-powerful one, came to announce to him that his wife would bear a son. Zechariah did not believe that. He lost his voice for nine months. And he named the baby, according to the instructions of the angel, John. John was born. <coughs> John was born of Elizabeth, the barren one. And Zechariah at the time, we read in the Gospel of St. Luke, said, You child will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. In the Gospel of St. John, we read, we read in chapter, in the first chapter, <clears throat> there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man God sent, cherry picked. Here he is, John. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness to the light that all through him might believe. He, John, was not the light, but was sent to bear witness to that light. He grew strong in the spirit. We know when he was in his mother's womb before growing, in his mother's womb, he was blessed by Christ himself. For the two children met in the wombs of their mothers. And instantly he prophesied through the mouth of his mother, Elizabeth, who said to the Virgin Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And he called her the mother of my Lord. He was six months old in his mother's womb when he spoke through his, her mouth, prophesying. He grew strong in the spirit, and when he was about 30 years old, a little bit older than the men and women who died in Afghanistan, he went in the wilderness to live a life of purity, chastity, virginity. The gospel tells us much about him, how he was eating bare locusts, dry fruits and honey, and he was girded with a leather belt to show that he was in control over his passions of the stomach and over what's down below it. He's the one to whom people came as an angelic voice that came with power to be baptized for the remission of their sins, to be prepared for the coming of the one whose shoes, sandals, John said, was not worthy to even untie, the pre to prepare for Messiah. John the prophet, Christ himself calls him the greatest of all the prophets. What does our hymn tell us? We just chanted it today two times. You have proved to be truly even more venerable than the prophets. Why? Since you're granted to baptize in the running waters the ones whom they proclaimed. They talked about him. John baptized him. What else did he prophesy when he didn't know who Messiah was? Seeing the young man coming to him. Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God is coming. Behold the Lamb of God. The prophet over all the prophets. He was a teacher, the teacher of repentance. He was the herald of the Lord, selected and loved by him. It is this John <coughs> whose purity of the heart enabled him to have a straight posture in the world, a world that was as crooked as ours is today. And not only live righteously following the commandments, meditating on the commandments of the Lord, but also bringing them to the world, telling people, repent, you're off. And you know, it doesn't go well when you go to somebody who is illegally living, illegally, sinfully living with a woman. St. John the Baptist followed the word of God, the commandment, with great courage, coming from a pure heart, and he went after the king. And this was the problem that we remember today. The king was living, breaking the law big time with his brother's wife. Had his brother Philip died, he could have married his wife had she had no children. 
But his brother was alive and she had a girl. Despite this, he sinfully married her and lived with her. St. John the Baptist went after him with other occasions. In the Gospel of St. Luke, saying, we read that Herod, the king, had sinned in other ways. And John was rough with him. Now this, this, put the, uh, the, uh, this was the straw that broke the camel's back here when he went after his private life that was actually publicly seen. Last night at the Vespers, we heard in the, in the beautiful hymnology that reminded us of the Holy Thursday hymns, a few things that describe a birthday party. I know you guys, those with kids, Paul, you like to have birthday parties for the kids, and we train them early from young ages to celebrate and have lots of things and receive the gifts and give to others and eat and all the desires of our hearts to be fulfilled and if they are not god forbid for the parents now the king <coughs> celebrated his birthday <coughs> at this party the forerunner's head was cut off and brought in on a dish oh unsavory banquet replete with profanity and bloody murder what profanity herodias's girl Salome performed a belly dance, probably mostly naked, and the king and the others got very excited. She danced the disciple of the evil, she danced the disciple of the all evil devil. That's how the girl was called, the disciple of the all evil devil, and took your head. Oh, banquet filled with blood, O oh, lawless Herod offspring of falsehood but if you had sworn we're told here if you had sworn if only you had not kept your oath for it was better to have lied and attain life than to speak truly and to cough off the head of the forerunner in the midst of the drunkenness and partying <coughs> whatever his <coughs> oath was beyond any imagination I'll give you anything you want up to half of the kingdom. Really? Who in the right mind would promise this? Well, it got to happen. The girl, the disciple of the old evil devil, at this drinking party of deceit, with Herodias in a rage, for she hated John the Baptist. We run in this final situation when Herod is asked to bring the head of St. John the Baptist. And this is the product of his debauchery, of his desires being followed as being empowered to have everything and anybody to commit the second greatest atrocity, atrocity of mankind. The beheading, the murder of the greatest of all prophets, John the Baptist who is not only the greatest of all the prophets, a teacher, the herald, but is also a martyr. We see him in the icon here in front of you, like the Lamb of God, stretching his neck in the prison to be decapitated, secretly, quietly, without any right to appeal, because he loved God more than the values of the world. He loved God more than the values of the world and he stood by the values and the commandments of God. What a great example he is for us. In the, uh, <clears throat> in the great picture of this murderous banquet, birthday celebration. We look at two characters that are opposed, Herod and John. St. Gregory Palamas draws the contrast here, drawing, telling us about Herod as an example of everything evil and impious. 
the fullness of wickedness, the power of ungodliness, the tool of lawlessness, the carnal one who followed his desires. Opposite to this, the forerunner John, pillar of all virtue and godliness, the summit of all God-bearing men, the, vis the visible resting place of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that produce piety and virtue. Opposites. And I'm sure it goes through your mind as it went through mine yesterday. I am not like Herod. Anything, but my parties are not like this. Okay, good. Thank God. Thank God. But I'm also, maybe, am I like St. John the Baptist? I struggle to be like him. I struggle to be like him. And today, I would like to challenge you a little bit to place you against Herod. And um, to tell you why today is a day of fasting. And why not just a pure day of feasting? Herod's desires could be fulfilled anytime, anything he wanted. Although he didn't have a new iPhone or access to whatever internet that is super fast to travel around the world and buy and visit and do anything, he was a powerful man. And his desire was sinful. He desired to live with his brother's wife, was married and had a child. Can anything worse than this can exist in our lives? One's life? Maybe yes, maybe no. But that kind of desire, brothers and sisters, although we say, I'm not like him, I'd like you to contrast with a different kind of desire, the worldly desire. St. Paisios of Mount Athos, in his first volume in the collection of many today, has a little chapter about worldly desires. And I would like to read to you a little bit from this. Those who do not put the brakes on their heart's desires for unnecessary material things, not desires of the flesh, these are out of the question, not desires of the flesh, women, alcohol, drugs. No, 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 no. These are all the question. What he's talking about here, the harsh desires for unnecessary material things. And do not gather their mind inside their heart in order to offer everything they have together with their very soul to God will be very miserable. And the nun asks him, Geronda, is it always bad to desire something? No. The heart's desire is not bad in itself. But when things, even things that are not sinful, take up a piece of my heart, they diminish my love for Christ. When things, even things that are not sinful, take up a piece of my heart, they diminish my love for Christ. Again, this kind of desire is bad because the enemy reduces my love for Christ. <clears throat> when I desire a useful thing, like a book, for example, and it ends up taking up a piece of my heart, then that is bad. Why should the book take a piece of my heart? Will I desire the book? Where will I yearn for Christ? Any desire, no matter how good it appears, cannot rival the desire for Christ or for the Panagia. When I give my heart to God, will not God give me his entire self in return? God seeks men's heart, for he said, my son, give me your heart. If man gives God his heart, God will grant him his heart's desires as long as as they will not be harmful to him. Only a heart given to Christ is not wasted. And only in, the, in Christ does one find in abundance the gift of divine love in this life and heavenly exaltion, ex, exaltion in the next life. We must avoid worldly things and not let, not let them occupy our heart. We must use only the simplest means 
to accommodate our needs. We must make sure, however, that the few things we use are sound. If I use a beautiful thing, I give all my heart to that beauty, and I leave nothing for God. For instance, you pass by somewhere, and you see a house with pretty marble work, designs, engravings, and so on. You admire the stones, the bricks, and you leave your heart there. Or you see a beautiful eyeglass frame in a store, and you desire it. If you don't buy it, you leave your heart at the store. If you buy it, you're hanging your heart from the eyeglass frames you're wearing. Women are especially vulnerable to this kind of deception. Few of them do not waste their hearts on vanities. What I'm trying to say is that the devil robs them of their rich heart through all these ephemeral, colorful, and shiny trinkets. Let's say one of them needs a plate. She will search for the one with a flowery pattern, as if the food would turn sour if the plate had no flowers. Some spiritual women may instead be moved by serious patterns, such as a double-headed eagle, and so on. And they wonder, why don't spiritual things touch me? Well, how can the heart be moved by spiritual things when it is scattered in cabinets and plates? You do not actually have a heart anymore. You only have a piece of flesh which beats inside mechanically, tick-tock, like a clock, just to make you walk. It is because the heart is dispersed to so many things. A bit of it, a bit of it going here, a bit of it going there, that nothing is left for Christ. And the nun asked him, in other words, Geronda, even these simple desires are sinful? And he answers, these simple desires, even when they are not sinful, are actually worse than the sinful ones. A sinful desire will shake a man at some point, and his conscience will bother him, and he will make an effort to repent. He will say, my God, I have sinned. On the contrary, these other desires, the worldly desires, the ones that we call, we call quote-unquote, the good ones, do not concern him at all. He believes that he is doing well. I love saying, I love well-made and beautiful things, he thinks. Besides, God created everything beautiful. Oh, yes. But his love does not go, is not to go to the, I'm sorry, but yes. But, but his love does not go to the creator. It goes to his creation, which is why we should break off from every desire. When someone makes an effort for Christ by sacrificing what he loves, no matter how good what he loves is, God will grant him an even greater peace and rest. So how do we get to the point of receiving from God from what we sacrifice? How can we sacrifice the things that we value so much and we consider beautiful, including our families? our children, our homes, our cars, our church, our carpet, our icons. Let us think of St. John the Baptist, the man with a pure heart, chaste, the virgin. St. Paisios wraps it up. Before the heart is cleansed, it has worldly desires and finds joy in them. A heart that is not cleansed finds joy in the worldly desires, just like I do. But when it is cleansed and purified, it no longer tolerates earthly desires, and its joys then are spiritual. The heart is purified when it loathes worldly desires. But until this happens, it is attracted to them, to the worldly desires. But you see, we do not want to upset the old self. We would rather do him all kind of favors. How then can we become imitators of Christ? We do not want to upset the old self. Well, Herod had the power to upset himself, the old Herod. 
who have taken the oath to break that oath and say, no, enough, we're not going to cut this guy's head. But he did not. Because of his pride, because of his pleasure, his desires being fulfilled. He's condemned. And the death he died with his wife were so shameful. This is the reason why the martyr John the Baptist, unlike other martyrs of the church, is remembered in the feasting with fasting. St. George, of course, St. George falls during the Lent. During Lent. St. Demetrius, the great martyr, for instance, and all the other martyrs, for none of them do we fast. But for St. For St. John the Baptist, the strict fasting, an observance of the atrocious act of Herod, who could not control his passions, his desires, is a lesson for us to work on our own desires. And the thing saying, I'm not the king, I don't have the party like this, and I don't drink myself under the table, put that to rest and listen to St. Paisios. Because what he's saying to us today, with a little bit harsh voice of the prophet is, wow, we better wake up. We are like Herod. We are being told we live in pleasures and there's no room in our heart for Christ. And what do we do? We kind of take that chunk of the heart that belongs to him and give it to our heart's desires. And we call ourselves good. And we continue to pat ourselves on the back. We we'll continue to dream about the festival, and about the church, about our families. When God wants our heart, give me your heart, he said. So today, we do remember and praise the great prophet, the forerunner, the teacher, the herald, the martyr, the one chosen by God himself to be his forerunner down to Hades, into Hades as well, as the hymn says. But we also have to put this on ourselves a little bit, brothers and sisters. Not only in the way we relate to the church and to the grace of God given to us in the church by participating in its life, in her life, but how we participate in the life of the world. And looking at St. John the Baptist as a model for those who live, who desire to live in Christ, to be righteous and to deal with with the spirit of wickedness of the world in an honorable way. I pray that you put this to heart today and in your prayers, praising the Lord privately and as we come together here, we also remember the words of St. Paisios calling on us to uh, put aside the old one and turn towards renewing ourselves, the spiritual ones. Amen.